All right, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Andrew Kreitzer, a senior product manager at Tableau, working to shape the future of Tableau Server, Tableau Mobile, and Tableau Public. You might have seen some of our team's latest features, like the brand new home experience and metrics, a whole new way to stay on top of your data. And if you haven't, go check it out in the showcase later on. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce two of our Tableau Zen Masters for this talk, 50 Reasons Your Organization Should Have a Center of Excellence. The first Zen, in no particular order, Simon Beaumont. This is his first year as a Zen Master, and I had the privilege of meeting Simon when I was up in our Fremont office for a day in the office with JLL. Simon leads JLL's BI Center of Excellence supporting a team of analysts, translating complex data into insights for operational and senior leaders. That particular day in Seattle, I walked into a jam-packed conference room with a million things on my mind. And when the talk started, I immediately closed my laptop because I came away with so much interesting information and new questions to ask and, and was really captivated. And it's truly worthy of your attention to provide the same today. Today he's speaking with fellow Zen, Emma White. It's Emma's second year as a Zen, and when I started to research a little bit about Emma on the Google machine, I came across a ton of Emma's outstanding accomplishments and contributions to the Tableau community. The one that struck my eye the most was Workout Wednesday. If you haven't seen Workout Wednesday, it's a place to really test your Tableau skills and try these challenges, these weekly challenges, that, that try the, new, the newest Tableau features and uh, basically teach you to be a great Tableau dashboard creator. Emma is a certified Tableau trainer and consultant in the UK with the Information Lab. Emma has also been a large supporter of Tableau Blueprint and in her spare time is an avid cyclist and hiker. Without further ado, Please give a warm tableau welcome to Simon and Emma. Cheers, Andrew. Thanks, man. Hi, everyone. Well, hi. <laughs> welcome to our talk. We're going to go through 50 reasons why you should have a center of excellence, but also how to achieve it. So, first question. What is a center of excellence? So, hands up, who has got a center of excellence in their organization? Oh, come on, Laura, you got to raise your hand. I want to see it funny single. <laughs> cool, so a fair few of you. Um, but a center of excellence can mean many things to many different people. So we just wanted to ask the question, what is a center of excellence? And for us, it's about people. Yeah, the technical stuff is important. We, it's pointless having Tableau if it doesn't work. But actually, when we talk about center of excellence, we talk about how we facilitate our people to be the best they can when it comes to seeing and understanding their data. So for that, we talk about culture, we talk about creating a framework of how we do BI within an organization, and we talk about an approach. So what we'll be sharing with you today in 50 Reasons really focuses on everyone that's here today, and that's us as individuals. So, why is a COE important? How has it mattered to me and Simon? And why should it matter to you as well? So we've kind of had a fantastic introduction, so I'll keep this a little bit short. Um, so yes, I'm a Tableau Zen Master. I am desktop and server certified. I'm a trainer and a consultant with the Information Lab. And I'm a customer success manager. And that means making our customers do great things with Tableau. And I also work a lot with organizations' center of excellences to train and support their users in data literacy, data analysis, and Tableau. And that's been really awesome for me to do because I love training, I love supporting people, and it enables me to always learn more and to be challenged as well. So thank you, Andrew, for the kind introductions. It's a pleasure to see you in Seattle and to visit the team. Um, I've been using Tableau since version 8, since 2014. In terms of what a COE means for me, it has genuinely changed my life. Um, when I first used Tableau about six, five, six years ago, you could have cut me and I'd have bled green. 
My career up to that stage had been Excel, Excel, Excel. And for me, data was all about reports and automation. But actually, I listened at the Tableau London user group to numerous organizations talk about, if you're going to use Tableau, focus on how it's used, focus on the difference it's made. And that, for me, has changed my career. I'm now looking at, and I'm honored to work within Jones Lang LaSalle, and we look at facilitating data-driven decision-making, going from intrigue to insight. And for me, I've realized it's not about IT, it's about the people and it's about the learning. And on that note, enough about us. So let, we haven't got any cool music to do the countdown begin. Um, but let the countdown begin. So number one is about, or one to six, is about strategy and vision. Before you go anywhere, you want to think about your mission statement. Critical to a CoE success is to find the purpose of what you're doing. Now, when I think of mission statement, I tend to think of NASA. Um, so that's all about everyone being involved in the same mission. So is your mission going to be to train others, to build and care for infrastructure? Is it going to be to actually do the reporting and create the analysis? What's the scope of your COE? Is it for the whole business? Is it for specific departments? Is it only in certain countries? And what are your goals? Is it to increase usage and adoption, to train so many people, to produce so much analytics in a certain time frame? And once you've written your mission, we have to think about strategy. How are you going to achieve that mission statement? And how are you going to align with the other business priorities as well? Is your focus on educating people, how are you going to go and do that? And once you've written your mission statement and your strategy, you also want to make sure that you're being transparent about it, that it's available for the rest of the business to read, that it uses non-technical terms so it's understandable, that you reevaluate re it regularly and you measure your progress against it. The strategy and vision sets how you're going to do it. But once you've done that, you want a roadmap. You want to excite people, and you want to be able to say, over the next one to five years, where are we going to take this organization when it comes to data? And a roadmap helps you define what are the individual components and the vision in terms of what are the products that it's going to mean for your end users. You want to ensure that you talk about how you're going to adopt things. So actually, it's not about, yeah, right, we can get really excited about explained data. Give me a core diagram. and you'll probably see um, I might be a bit of a geek. Uh, but actually, for end users, it doesn't matter. They don't really want to talk about Tableau releases. They want to say what's in it for them and what's the difference it's going to make. So by setting a roadmap that is understandable, you're not trying to say it's about going back to the future. What you're trying to say is what are we going to do in the next one, two, three, four, five years that people can understand and people can relate to. And you also want to define senior engagement. So yes, we can talk about a center of excellence. We can talk about our vision, our strategy. But actually, you want the buy-in of your senior team. Because if you've got the buy-in of your senior team, it means you are far less challenged in needing to justify your vision and your strategy, because everyone buys into it. But make sure that your senior team can understand it. Make sure that they're part of defining it. So it isn't seen as IT or BI telling them what their future will be. They're part of it. They are the ones defining their future. They are the ones that are bought into it. So it's a collaboration and a partnership as opposed to a statement and a telling. And once you've got that senior engagement, you can use that. So don't just assume, I've got that senior engagement. Great, everyone's bought into it. Make the most of it. Within JLL, we have senior um, leadership steering groups, and we use that to help prioritize our work. So actually, when we get conflicting priorities, it isn't us deciding what we will do next. It's actually the business helping us do that. And it's about a long-term future, and people are going to understand what am I going to get when, and they being part of the solution. And if you do that successfully, Gone will be the days where you get the mine, mine, mine. And I'll guarantee you, probably, I would imagine every single person in this room 
would have had the experience of a senior leadership saying, mine is far more important than that person's, so when do I get mine? Actually, you know what? If they're part of the discussion, they're part of the prioritization setting, they will trust and they will believe why the things are being done in that order as opposed to that mine, mine, mine. Knowing your audience. If you're running a COE, marketing what you do is going to be a big part of your job. Your audience is likely to be a mixture of people. It's going to be senior stakeholders, and it's going to be employees at the coalface using your analytics on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to know your user base, but you also have to know how to reach them and how to reach them in the best ways. You have to think about your methods of communication. Is it best by email? Is it best face-to-face? -face? Are you working across different, different time zones? If you are, think about when your message is going to be delivered. Think about the level of communication that you're having. So with senior stakeholders, you'll probably use different language than you would with everyday users. And you have to think about all of these things when you're delivering your message about how important it is that what you're doing. So seven to 10, we move on to govern data. I apologize, it's not the most glamorous and sexy of subjects, but without it, your COE will fail because you can't have a successful COE unless the data that you rely on is governed and reliable. Just saw lots of cringy faces when we talked about data governance. Um, but actually, I, I actually find it really interesting because I'm one of those really sad people. Um, your data has to be reliable and it has to be transparent to be successful. If a user is looking at a dashboard, they're going to ask lots of questions. They're going to be like, well, what does this data connect to? Where is it coming from? Who, who owns it? How is it maintained? Is it an extract? And if it is, is it up to date? Is it a live connection? And if it's a live connection, is that database actually trustworthy? If I've got questions about what I'm looking at, who do I contact? Now, we've seen in the keynote this morning that we do have some tools that Tableau have developed to help us do that. So um, we have the new data catalog that's in the newer versions of Tableau, and that looks like it's going um, in great, uh, great releases as well, like lots of new features coming up. So that's definitely one to check out, and there are some more sessions on that this week. And we've also got Tableau Blueprint, again mentioned in the keynote, and this is a framework for helping you be successful in rolling out analytics in your organization, and Blueprint has lots of great information about data governance as well, so another one to check out. So you've cataloged your data, but how are you going to publish it? How are you going to use it? I have to say, my heart sinks when I look at organizations or go into organizations and I see 100 workbooks and 100 data sources. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can use Tableau to create extracts at a workbook level. But in reality, a lot of your data will be reused. So let's talk about superstores. If you're looking at sales, the likelihood is you're probably going to have to have five or six dashboards that all look at sales. If you don't publish your data sources, you will be having to get Tableau to refresh that same data five times. There's then a risk that your data isn't consistent, as Emma will describe next, and it creates inefficiency and risk. So I would really encourage you, if you don't within your organization currently, then look at how to utilize published data sources so you create a data playground where all the hard work is done. So you publish the data once and you reuse it multiple times. But I, can't, I will say, and I'll be honest, it's not easy to do that. It is a real effort and you have to think about how you're going to do data sources right for them to really be of value. But you will benefit things in the long term if you do it. So once you've published and certified your data sources, you also want to make sure that your data is consistent. So as Simon said, you define your data source once and you use it multiple times. When you're defining your data source, you're probably going to think about all the things that you can put in it that's going to help the end user as well, but it's also going to help the process. So let's take a profit ratio calculation, for example. It's most likely that that profit ratio should be worked out in the same way across the entire organization. So if you include it in your published data source, if you document it, then you're going to be reducing the risk that it's going to be wrong somewhere. 
You're also reducing the risk that someone's going to write that calculation differently. Um, and it's just going to be a lot easier for users just to connect to that data, and it's already there waiting for them to use. The same goes for joins and business logic as well. So anything that you can put into that data to be consistent, do it. And the last one on data quality. Great having published data sources, great having consistent and catalogued data, but if the data itself is wrong and the data is not owned from a data quality perspective, forget it. Um, before I joined JLL, I used to work in the NHS, which is the National Health Service in England. I would guarantee you that any time I put a dashboard in front of someone and they didn't like the look of it, the response I'd get back is the data's wrong. And basically, they would turn around and say, well, the data's wrong, you fix it. But in reality, you don't want it to be the IT team's responsibility to be able to fix the data. What you want to make sure is you empower your end users to be able to actually fix it themselves. And I'll give you one practical tip about how to do that. Alongside a dashboard, yes, create the performance data. Yes, create the charts, benchmark your teams. But do the dull stuff. Create a data quality validation tab where users can go in and see their errors, and actually you're empowering them to say, because you can see it, you can fix it. So actually, as an IT team or a BI team, you facilitate them, you empower them, and you give them the tools to be able to resolve it themselves. Any time that they can't do that, it will always come back to your, your shore. You have to allow them to have the tools to do it, and by incorporating data quality alongside performance, that's the way that you can resolve that never-ending challenge of how do we fix data that's wrong. Because as soon as you've got data that's reliable and governed of good quality, you can then start to do the exciting stuff. And with that, let's go on to the next section so we can put data governance behind us now. Can we breathe again? Um, this is all about best practice, and we're going to talk about not only visualization best practice, but best practice for running a CRE as well. Our first point is develop your playbook. Now, when I hear the word playbook, I automatically think of American football. And as we're in the US, it's just football. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> when an American football team goes onto the field, a single word or a hand signal lets the entire team know what their routes are, or routes, and what they're doing next. And this should be exactly the same in your organization with business intelligence as well. All of your analysts should know what the development process looks like. So if they're given a new project to do, they know who their stakeholders are that they can go and contact and ask questions of. They know where the data is or where the data stewards are that they can go to to help get the data. They know where to publish for development and to get feedback. And when that feedback's given, they know how to sign it off and promote it to production. So your playbook should be written to help your analysts understand what to do, but it also allows your users to understand what to expect when they engage in a new project with you as well. We've got the playbook, but actually from an end user point of view, one of the best things you can do is set standards. So this isn't about, when I say standards at times, I've had numerous, at times, heated debates with colleagues in the UK um, about does that mean you're restricting people's freedom or creativity? Absolutely not. Probably does mean you're not going to do an exploding 3D pie chart. Um, but what it's trying to say is, what is our vision for how a dashboard looks in your organization? So if you think about all of the websites you go on, Probably the reason you go on them, and I'll use one from the UK, which is the BBC website, regardless if you go on the weather, the news, the sport, the user interface is the same. So imagine giving your users 10 dashboards that have all got different branding, have all got different filter placements, or have all got different functionality. They get, first off, where do I start? They get a lack of confidence in terms of your ability to deliver a single product. So for me and Emma, Setting standards isn't about restricting, comfort, uh, restricting creativity. It's about creating a consistency for your users, which will then result in a positive user experience. So I'll give you a, just a brief 
how we do that. When there's a hands up, when you've got a interaction in your dashboard, so a filter action or a URL action, how many people put a visual prompt to say to their end users that that's available? Cool. That's a reasonable number. For those of you that don't, there's no criticism, but my challenge to you would be, how do your end users know it's there? And if they don't know it's there, you're guaranteed they'll click on something and probably ring you up going, my dashboard's broke, so I've clicked on something and the numbers have changed. Um, so actually it's about trying to give them that guided experience to allow them to know what they ex to expect. And the good news for you is there are a couple of organizations that have done that and have actually been kind enough to publish their examples to Tableau Public. So if you go onto Tableau Public and you search for BBC audiences or for JLL, you will be able to download their corporate viz standards and actually see how they do that in their organization. And I hope that if other organizations do that from today, after this talk, that you'll be inspired to be able to share that back to the community, because most of what is in our viz standards isn't invented by us, it's come from you guys. So actually part of it is sharing back and becoming better as a community. Being inquisitive. As analysts, we're usually quite nosy people anyway. We like to ask questions and we like to get to the bottom of problems. We heard a lot about data culture this morning and being inquisitive is something that we have to embed in our culture as well. So getting into the mindset of asking questions of your users, your data and yourself to get to what it is exactly someone wants visualized or what it is um, that they're having trouble with and they need answers to. Another best practice, keep it simple. I'm a big fan of the hashtag Tableau Kiss on Twitter. This has started, I believe, by my colleague Chris Love, who's also a Zen master. Um, and the idea is to reduce the feeling that you have to make a piece of art every time you do something in Tableau. Really, what we're trying to do is answer a question in the best way possible. And again, we have to think about our audience. It doesn't always have to be a Sankey chart or a call diagram or something complex, especially if our audience isn't going to understand it. Sometimes a bar or a line chart tells it best. But obviously, you can use a Sankey chart if it is for the right audience, and it does answer the question that's being asked. Another fantastic project that I want to make sure that everyone's aware of is Everyday Dashboards, again, started by Chris Love. This is a website that collects uh, examples of Tableau in the wild. Um, obviously, it's usually with dummy data, but these tend to be real-life dashboards that people are using in their organizations. And they're split by department, which I find really helpful as well. So you've got um, sort of HR, marketing, um, and they're using fairly simple charts, but in a way that produces some great insights and analysis. And of course, we have the Big Book of Dashboards, which is written by Stephen Wexler, Jeffrey Schaefer, and Andrew Cockroof. And they have some fantastic examples of simple but effective dashboards in there as well. Celebrating your wins. Unfortunately, at some point in your COE journey, someone's probably going to ask you to justify why you do what you do. This can be tricky if you don't have any use cases in your back pocket ready to go. So what I always tell organizations that I work with is as you go along your journey, make sure you document your wins as you go along. So use your Tableau server repository. That's the database that underlies your Tableau server and records every single interaction. Have a look at what's really popular on there. Have a look at what users are being um, delivered to their inboxes by looking at subscriptions. Track down popular works, reach out to the authors, and ask them some key questions. Ask them, how has this saved you time? How has this saved the business money? Has it actually generated any income? And I've got a template which will be available after this session for you to do this in your organization as well if you're not already doing it. So just ask some key questions that gets all the necessary information for you to be able to go, this is why we do what we do and this is why it's important. So you documented your wins, 
A way of doing that is also to measure engagement. And you can do that in two ways. You can measure direct engagement, so in other words, logins and usage. That's the simple stuff, and it all comes from Postgres. But you can also document indirect engagement. So if you're talking about removing the barriers to your data, most of our business consumers are busy people. So if you just look at indi uh, direct engagement, you're looking at them logging on, them viewing dashboards. But actually, if you're savvy and clever, if you encourage your users to use subscriptions and alerts, you allow your users to view it on their terms. So if they're mobile and they're out on the ground, most of the time, they're not going to have a laptop on them. If you ask them to subscribe to something, they will likely get it on their mobile, and they can view it on their terms without having to load up their laptop. So actually, you can start to understand the different types of users you've got in terms of those that are simply consuming the data traditionally. In other words, every day they log on and view 20 dashboards, or those that are a little bit more intelligent or clever um, in terms of they can start to subscribe and use alerts to have that guided journey and view it on their terms. Monitoring your server. Now, this gets me excited, but it might not get everyone else excited in the room. This is all about, yes, <laughs> my fellow people. Um, so this is all about monitoring the physical server that your Tableau server is installed on. This may be an actual machine in your office. It may be on the cloud. If you're lucky enough to use Tableau online, you don't have to worry about this too much. But this is all about knowing what resources you've got available and knowing when to expand those resources for demand. There are quite a lot of community tools that help you do this. This is no, by no means an exhaustive list. Um, Tabjol is developed by Tableau developers, but it's not like an official product. It is found on GitHub. And what Tabjol does is it allows you to simulate users interacting with views on your server, to push it to its limits, to you, so you know how many concurrent users you can have at any one time. You can set yourself a threshold, and you know that when you're getting close to that threshold, you have to have those conversations about providing more resources for your server. You've got other tools like Tabmon, Perfmon, the resource monitoring tool, which is uh, fairly new to Tableau Server as well, which do things like measure memory and CPU usage. And if you want to go further with this, um, then definitely check out the server admin Tableau forum and the virtual server admin user group as well. As well as monitoring performance of the physical server, we need to monitor the performance of the content that's on the server as well. And I've seen some organizations do this really well, and they have actually built in using the performance recorder as part of the publish to production process. So they have to make sure that when they're creating a desktop or publishing to server, they use the inbuilt performance recorder to make sure that the viz loads within a certain time frame. That performance recorder will give you a workbook output, and it tells you where your bottlenecks might be. So it can tell you if your data is taking a long time to come from the database. It can tell you if the view is just taking a long time to build because it's complex. And then you can go and make changes. So you can change how that workbook or view is authored to make it more performance. And you can use that to educate your analysts on design best practice as well. And a good thing for all of you guys, you're in a Tableau conference, so hopefully the term of a community isn't that alien to you. But actually, you know what? The community is probably your biggest single source of best practice. So leverage user groups. As I said, it made a massive difference to me attending my first ever London Tableau user group and getting that engagement with others so I could learn. I'm fortunate enough to lead the healthcare user group as well. And that's about sharing ideas, sharing best practice. But you've also got every single Tableau conference that has been held in either Europe or the States. All of those sessions are recorded and put on YouTube. Utilize it. You don't need to be at conference and jot down everything you see. You can digest it later on your terms. But then there are also community initiatives, and we'll touch on some of them later. But Think Data Thursday, for instance, Tableau Tip Tuesday. It's an opportunity to be able to engage with the community on a regular basis and get their expertise without having to see them. So the next session is all about innovation. 
which is about keeping your users excited, engaged, and keeping your content fresh. Hands up here who uses the beta program from Tableau. Okay, quite a few, that's good. Um, I'm just gonna put this on the screen for you to have a read and a laugh. Um, so if you don't already in your organization, then have, um, have a look at the Tableau beta program. It's completely free for you to get involved. You just have to sign up. And it allows you to download uh, the desktop and the Tableau server in beta. If you've got the resources, hopefully you can install those things on your organization's uh, hardware. Um, and the idea is that you're giving your users and your analysts exposure to what's coming next in the product to keep them excited and engaged with what's going on. We talked about a playbook earlier. So we talked about the beta, the image just shared the beta release, but also think ahead. So when we as analysts are excited by Tableau 2019.4 coming up, put yourself in your users' shoes. Think about what it will mean for them and start to plan ahead and following a new release, challenge yourself as a team to say, how are we gonna use set actions in our organization? How are we gonna adopt parameter actions? How are we gonna adopt recommended content? So actually you're guiding people through new content and you're creating that joint excitement. Showcase it in newsletters. Let them know it's coming. Create the buzz and allow your users to share in that experience. Don't just allow it to be the analysts and don't allow it to happen by accident just because you've got one enthusiastic analyst that's looking at the latest version themselves. Adopt it and consider how you are gonna use it in your organization and embed it in your standards and embed it in your playbook. It's fair to say I probably needed to say this one and not Emma. Um, so benefit from Tableau partners. Um, we are fortunate enough in the community to have numerous Tableau partners that have got a lot of expertise and a lot of experience. Yes, you can pay for consultancy hours and I'm sure Emma would love you to do that. Um, but you know what, you can go along to the booth and you can just ask questions. You can go onto people's websites and you can consume some of their experience and their knowledge. And I would thoroughly encourage you to do so. The one takeout that I've had in my career, you don't need to know it all. You're not gonna get any benefit from being the world's leading Tableau person knowing every single answer. You can't. So just make the most of the people around you and some of those people are in Tableau partners and are available to support you. You can also benefit from Tableau. So we're at conference, we know through conversations this week that the staff at Tableau are incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly passionate about what they do. But what I love about the people at Tableau is they're also so involved in the community as well and love having conversations with customers and getting ideas. Um, so make sure that you're engaged with those people as well. That can be your account manager at Tableau, but also if you look in the wider community, there's tons of people at Tableau that are active on Twitter and, and things like that. Um, so I've named a few here. Uh, Andrew Beers is the CTO. He's incredibly active in the community and on Twitter, getting ideas, letting people know about releases. Andy Cockgreave uh, does work for Tableau. He is also quite a good magician as well. Just ask him to do some tricks for you if you catch him. Um, Andy has delivered lots of talks at conference. He knows his data visualization history inside out. He knows lots of, about design best practice. Again, he's very engaged. Kesha, Kent, and Joanne are all part of the development team. Um, Kent, for example, is involved in mapping, looks a little bit like Superman, and um, is just fantastic at getting engaged with customers to know what they're doing with mapping, what they would like to do, and incorporating that in the development process. Kesha's worked on, worked on extensions and has worked really closely actually with a lot of partners who are building out extensions as well. Um, and Bethany Lyons is just a fantastic statistician. She knows everything there is to know. And she's also doing some sessions here this week, um, but she's another one to watch as well. She teaches some amazing things. Just to put that into context, I attended my first Tableau London News Group about three or four years ago. And the one thing I remember is the last session, I was knackered, I was hung over, um, and I attended a Bethany Lyons session. Um, I must have been mad. But what I learned, I had no idea what a lollipop chart was. Um, 
and Bethany tried to explain it to us in 10 minutes. I didn't have a clue what she was doing, but actually, throughout the next year, we adopted that chart type as being our way of benchmarking. I didn't need to remember the how, I just needed that one light bulb idea to take back to my organization. And just listening to some talks by Bethany, I guarantee you, you will not have a clue what she's talking about, um, <laughs> but you will get some light bulb moments just from her expertise and her passion. So just ending innovation, the thing that's closest to my heart and the thing that I do in my own time, what I do on the train is Tableau Public. I publish visits. And actually, I do that because I enjoy it. Um, I do it because I'm creative and I like to share. But actually, from a business point of view, Tableau Public can also be a great source of inspiration and innovation about how your organization can do visits. And we just wanted to pay tribute to one man and that man is Mr. Creeble. Um, so Andy Creeble is a Tableau Public Hall of, uh, tab sorry, a Tableau Zen Master Hall of Fame. Um, but the reason we wanted to share it is, earlier this year, Andy created the visual vocabulary, and he published it on Tableau Public. The Viz vocabulary is an online version of the Financial Times Guide to Analytics, and it talks about all different chart types but it talks about how you can use the best, uh, those chart types in the best possible way. So when should you use a line chart? When should you use a bar chart? But the best bit of it is if Andy is in a good mood, he will allow you to download that workbook and he will allow you to understand how he's built it so you don't have to guess how to replicate it. You can reverse engineer it from what Andy's done. And I would just say there's a reason it has been viewed 800 and, or, so 81,000, that is 817,000. Yeah, there is a reason it's viewed 817,000 times. It's because it is awesome. And I will guarantee you I use it a lot at work. Okay, so Simon mentioned at the beginning that our focus is on people. So people was actually our biggest section when we were coming up with the 50, 50 points. So we split it into two. So this first section is about users so those consuming your work in Tableau in your organization. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand who our users are. This might be easier if you're in a smaller organization, but if you're in a global organization with a lot of users, it can get quite tricky. We have to understand our users because we want to know how they're using Tableau. We want to know how we can make it easier for them to use Tableau to remove any barriers they've got from adopting it. We can do this in a number of ways. So this, for example, is just one of the built-in Tableau Server admin views on, um, that you have on any Tableau Server. It shows me who's logging in over time, and I can then go and interrogate this data further using um, kind of the, the interactive online desktop version. But we've also got a lot of community resources out there as well. So my colleague Ravi Mistry started Project Griffin a few years ago. This project creates custom admin views that you can just download from Tableau Public, plug them into your repository, and there's tons of different ones out there looking at you know, who's subscribing to what, who's creating custom views, who users are. Paul, who's actually in the front row, um, has a fantastic blog as well, more from um, the managerial aspect of, of, of running a Tableau server scale out some fantastic content on there about how they monitor what they do as well. Um, and Mark Jackson, again, uh, is a fountain of knowledge about Tableau Server, but also has some fantastic custom admin views that you can download and plug and play as well. And from your end user perspective, there's a phrase we use in terms of confidence breeds adoption. So it's great having great dashboards, but what's the point of them if no one uses them? So just as when you get a new TV at home, in theory, you've got a user guide, and if you're a bloke, you ignore it. Um, but actually, when you first got a dashboard and you first got a new user to Tableau, you want to have the same, you want to have the same support. So actually, how do you onboard people? As a COE, how do you support your users to be able to use the content you create? So I'd encourage you that any time you get a new Tableau user, create a basic welcome pack. Create a basic guide in terms of how to use Tableau how to interact with things, how to subscribe, and make yourself visible. Email them examples, welcome them so they get a sense of purpose and a sense of wanting to belong to the Tableau team and the Tableau journey that you're creating. 
and invest in your users through data literacy. We heard it this morning in our keynote, but actually data, data is a skill. So how can you guarantee that when you create a chart and you create a dashboard for someone, that they've got the skills to be able to use it and the skills to be able to interpret it and to be able to take the insights and turn it into action? Well, one of the ways that we do that is through data literacy and creating a training program for our end users. I know you could interpret data literacy as analysts, but actually for me it's far more important that you invest in your end users so they know what to do with the dashboard as opposed to investing in your analysts for data literacy. Confidence is all about making people trust the team that you work with as well. And we can do this by making our center of excellence or our analytical team visible to end users. And there's lots of different ways that we can do this. But the idea is that we make people comfortable coming to us and asking for help, asking for instruction. So don't lock yourselves away. Do things like open office hours, tableau doctor sessions, run lunch and learns, run webinars, any way that you can think of of making your team more accessible to the wider business. Even just smiling when you see them is, is good as well. And on that smiling note, um, one of the things that is most personal to me and in terms of my Tableau journey is a concept called positive deviance. In the NHS, when I started using data, everything got used to beat people up. Everything was used to focus on the negative and what was read. There's a concept out there called positive deviance, which in a nutshell is using data to celebrate success so people want to have an association want to be part of it. So rather than send out the list of the teams that are failing, why don't you go and send out a list of the teams that are achieving? And I can guarantee you, because it happened to me, the moment you send out lists that are achieving, you'll get inundated with phone calls going, why am I not on the list that you've said thank you to? But the answer back to that is, well, if you fix these things and you improve your performance by doing these actions, you will be the next time we run it and that people want to be associated with thanks and praise. So by doing it, you get people to associate Tableau with positivity and data with positivity, so it naturally creates an, if you like, ever-evolving, ever-increasing engagement because they want to have that recognition. Just to formalize that, we just wanted to quote a review, uh, quote from the Harvard Business Review. So somewhere in your organization, groups of people are already doing things differently and better. To create lasting change, find areas of positive deviance and fan the flames. And I would go one step further, use data as the catalyst to fan the flames. Identify your champions. There's going to be people in your business that just get the message you're trying to, to tell them. You have people that log in regularly, that get those subscriptions sent to their inbox. They're going to be going out there and saying, have you seen this? This is really cool. It saved me so much time, and it makes my life so much easier. We need to know who, who those people are and leverage them to spread that enthusiasm. It saves you doing a lot of work as well. And one of the ways we can do that is, once you've identified who they are, is to reward them. Swag always goes a long way. Um, but there's also lots of other ways that we can do it as well. And working with different organizations, I've seen some great things from uh, little buttons or avatars that you have on your internal networks that identify that you're a Tableau champion or a data champion. Um, I've seen things in email signatures. I've seen internet pages that list these people out. So it identifies them so the rest of the business know that if they have questions, they can go to them and ask but it also kind of incentivizes people to go, oh, I want that as well. We talked about our users. Now to satisfy all of you guys, because you are probably Tableau users and slightly geeky like us, um, we wanted to focus on 12 ways, 12 ways to invest in your people who are your analysts. So we want to start by saying, create a culture of learning. So I will guarantee you, Emma and I are Tableau Zen Masters, there are numerous things that we do not know about Tableau. And I, to be honest, wouldn't want to know because I always want to be learning. And you need to recognize, no matter where you are in your Tableau journey as an analyst, you need to continue learning. So you need to create a culture in your organization where people are allowed and expected to learn on the job, not when they're at home. 
So in JLL, I actively encourage my staff to do community events and participate in community activity in their working day. We're only talking one or two hours, but it just creates the expectation that when you're on the job, you will be learning. And some of the things that you can do in the community to allow that, Makeover Monday is run by Andy Creeble and Eva Murray, and I think there might have been quite a few people that attended yesterday. Um, but actually, you can do that in a workplace. You've also got Storytelling with Data by Cole Knaflik Nalsbammer. And actually, Cole is probably my biggest inspiration in the data viz community. Because Cole doesn't focus on the technical, Cole focuses on the story. So her challenge is all about how do you create an insightful line chart and an insightful bar chart. My analysts looked at me when I was like I was crazy when I first challenged them to say, create an annotated bar line chart. Like, we do that every day. But actually, we got 10 people doing it, and every single one of those did something different. And actually, by bringing everything together, we got the best bits of it, and we had our best practice blueprint for how we're going to do annotated line charts. And lastly, and a shout out to some of the team that are here, um, there's also Workout Wednesday. So if you are slightly more the surprise that Lorna was the um, not one of the quiet ones. Um, so actually, if your analyst of a technical nature, Workout Wednesday is ideal to give them a challenge to grow their technical skills, but do it on the job. Learn how to do it, but also, if you're going to get an analyst doing it, get them to then share their learning back with the rest of the team when they've got their next team meeting. So you don't just get one person learn it, you get one person do it, and then they share that knowledge with the rest of the team. What I work um, a lot with other organizations to do is develop skill belts or training programs. And one thing that is quite tricky is encouraging people to take the time out of their day-to-day -to, -day to go through and do these training programs and get better at Tableau. A way that is uh, really successful that I found is to gamify that learning, have a sense of personal achievement, and see progression at what you're doing. One person who's done that fantastically well is Fee Gordon, who now also works at JOL. <laughs> Hi, hey, Fee. Fee. <laughs> loud, loud um, Kiwi at the back in case anyone wants. <laughs> Fee invented Tableau Quest. Um, you can find it on her blog. I think she's done quite a few Tableau talks that might be recorded as well um, that you can go and have a look at. But the idea is to go from rookie to rock star different levels and each level you have to achieve certain things from watching the online tableau learnings to doing makeover mondays and workout wednesdays to doing lunch and learns where you present something back to your organization that you've learned in tableau all the way through to doing the tableau certification exams as well not only does this give a structure to your learning so people know what they've got to do next and they're not just kind of floating around here there and everywhere but it also gives a sense of achievement and purpose as well. And on the back of that, Ratnesh Pandey on Tableau Public has created this dashboard, this is the mobile version, that connects to data that you can collect about your team and where they're up to with that Rookie to Rockstar challenge. So you can see like a leaderboard and you can see what people have achieved and where people have got to go as well. And once you've come up with that training plan, once people are starting to go through it, you can reward them through certification. So if you don't know, Tableau has a certification for desktop and the server product. Desktop has three levels. Tableau server has two levels. And the idea is that you reward people's learning through paying for them to go and do the certifications. If you want to find a little bit more about what they involve and how people have, you know, what people's experiences have been of taking them, there's a few blogs that you can go and read as well. And if you do all of that right, you'll ask, so what? Well, actually, one of the big reasons that you're doing all of that is for retention. So professions such as nursing have got it ingrained in them that if they're going to treat patients safely, they're expected to learn new techniques. Why wouldn't your analysts do the same? What you could have done in Tableau five years ago is radically different to what you can do in Tableau today. So actually, you never want to stand still. So we want to retain our best analysts. And I just challenge you to say, what happens if you don't do it? Do your analysts stand still? They get 
stagnant, the best ones will leave. So actually, by investing in your analysts, you create that USP that people want to be part of your team because they recognize you are different, and together you become better. Community. Building community takes time, but it's really important. If we think about the Tableau community here, we've probably got friends that we catch up with, we speak to each other on Twitter. But community in an organization is important as well because it builds knowledge and shared skills. It creates a network of individuals that can come together to solve problems, bounce around ideas, and get feedback on their work. Building community does take time, and little and often is the key to momentum. And you can never be too visible with your analysts. So all of your analysts are individual. Some are geeks, some, well, probably most are geeks. Um, some are short, <laughs> some are tall. Um, but they're all individual. I don't know why you looked at Paul when I said short. Um, but actually, the reason we share that is that you will never be able to do a single thing that satisfies all of your analysts. So you can never be too visible. And often, little or many things and often are better than one big thing. So I think Elisa Fink said it in terms of the community, you can never be too visible. You can never be too active with your end users either because you're guaranteed not everything will work for everyone. Communication. I often go into organizations, and I usually find that there's one person who's considered the Tableau expert. And unfortunately, a lot of their time is in answering emails and questions from individuals on a one-to-one -one basis to help people. What if we made that communication different? Instead of being one-to-one, -one, what about if we created a forum or a platform for those questions to be asked and answered? It saves that one person from answering every single question, but instead opens it up to other people to answer the questions as well. So we want to move away from that one-to-one -one connection and instead use whatever we have available to us internally in an organization to create a forum where people can ask those questions. And in terms of partnership, your analysts will be the Tableau experts, but we don't want the analysts to know everything about the organization. So combine your analysts with the business users. Every dashboard, identify a business owner. They can help define the requirements. Identify the subject matter expert who works in partnership with the analyst. So then you get dashboards that are insightful, not just pretty. Diversity. So we've, we heard a lot about diversity and inclusion at Data Plus Women yesterday. We had lots of good discussions about how to do it. I'm quite lucky I work for an organization that is very diverse. We're all from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds. But the great thing about that is I learn so much. We have different skills. We, some of us are statisticians, some of us are designers. And because of that, I can always go and learn something new from someone. We all think differently, and we come at problems at different angles as well. And we talked about making your COE a USP for your analysts, so why you want to retain them. But I would just say, use it as a way to attract talent as well. So why, use it as a way to say, why do you want to come and work for us? Because there are plenty of organizations out there that are using Tableau. And if you want to think about that creatively, you could do what I did when I was in the NHS. People do not come to work for the NHS to get rich. So we've got to create some way to attract them. So actually, we created a Tableau public viz that showcased some of the analysts in the team showcase some of the ways we worked, and then we use that as our advert, because most of the people that I wanted to attract would be on Tableau Public. So it's just a little way of subtly embracing the COE and sharing that ethos as part of an advertising campaign. As analysts, we're probably quite used to going out into the community or Googling how to do stuff and learning from others, but we can do that as a COE as well. There are lots of amazing CRE leaders around the world that are in the Tableau community. Um, we can go on the Tableau forums. We can watch webinars from CRE leaders. And we should always borrow ideas from each other and share experiences as well. And lastly, on your people, be in it together. So do viz reviews. So rather than work in silos, Create viz reviews where you all come together and as analysts you share what you're doing with each other. So actually you're looking and you're sharing 
How am I working? What am I doing? So you all thoroughly understand that. And just quoting Fee again, um, Fee's got a great terminology of I like and I suggest. There's a real risk of Viz reviews that they become associated with negativity, but actually do it in a supportive way so that people feel protected to share ideas. And for God's sake, don't make it about colour. Um, there's a real risk that when you do a Viz review, it becomes about formatting, and that's not the purpose of it. It should be about insights and design. Don't be afraid of failure. When I think about culture, I, I also want organisations to create a culture where you're not frightened of failing or making a, a mistake. If we think about some scientific mistakes, actually sometimes they've led to inventions. So this is a pacemaker and it was actually invented by mistake. It was meant to monitor the heartbeat, but instead it was shocking people's heart to stay in rhythm. Um, but it invented the pacemaker. So when you're creating your COE, encourage people to admit to their mistakes. And if people admit to their mistakes, then we'll learn something. We can get other people to come and help us. And our last section to finish on, deliberately we wanted to finish on this, is return on investment. So how do you demonstrate the difference that your COE is making? So I'll start with a very one simple one. It is not just enough to do. You have to be able to evidence it. So how will you evidence it? Treat your COE like a business. So we've already gone through documenting your wins. So those, those projects that have saved time, saved money, generated income. But you can also do it by tracking other things as well. So your engagement, the number of users on your server, the number of subscriptions that you send out to people's inboxes, the number of people you've trained, the number of support tickets you've answered or questions you've answered, for example. And if you're going to monitor return on investment, make it visible. Develop a Tableau dashboard so that everyone can see the value that those dashboards are bringing. And a shameless plug. Um, if you want an example of how to do that, Pop onto, Tableau, um, pop onto YouTube and watch the, the talk that Paul Chapman delivered at Tableau Conference Europe and last year in New Orleans, where we share how JLL has delivered return on investment by monitoring it and making it visible. And raise your organization's profile. Successful COEs get noticed. We've seen lots of talks over the years at Tableau Conference from large organizations that run COEs and they attract talent by doing that as well. We've got JOL, for example, Comcast, Spotify, Jaguar Land Rover. They've all done some fantastic talks that you can go onto YouTube and watch, but the idea is that if you have a successful COE, your organization will get noticed. And the last one that we wanted to end on is a COE does not have to be expensive. Yeah, you can send people on training, you can get them certificated, you can even be lucky enough to come to have a conference and get drunk for a week. Um, <laughs> But some of the best things you can do are free. And some of the best things you can do are around culture and investing in people. So even if you take away three or four things today, probably most of those things are things that you can do today because they are free and they are not technical. And that is our 50. We would just encourage you, please do fill out the session evaluation. And if you do want these slides, we've actually created a Tableau public workbook um, where you can go onto our Tableau account and you can see those slides as a workbook so you can access them for yourself. So on behalf of Emma and I, a massive thank you for coming to see us. Thank you, everyone.